Well, look, I guess there was no surprise that uh, in this year's federal budget that the, the government has addressed what's been a very strong narrative this year on uh, housing market issues, particularly affordability. And look, uh, I guess to give them their credit, the government did address all the issues. Now, I'm not sure whether they'll have a significant, particularly short-term impact on housing market dynamics, uh, but certainly they can be given kudos for, uh, for directing what has been a, a very robust debate uh, in terms of uh, affordability issues uh, this year. So let's have a look at some of the, uh, some of the policies that were announced in the budget. Um, I guess uh, the first one, which has been a very strong narrative, and that's been first home buyers, because that directed directly at, uh, at housing affordability. Uh, and we do have um, very low numbers of first home buyers, particularly in the Sydney market, no surprise given that strong prices growth over the last five years really has sidelined first home buyers out of the market, I believe almost uh, permanently we're going to see very low numbers of first home buyers. So the federal government's um, uh, now offering an opportunity for first home buyers to save uh, in a particular super saver account in their superannuation savings that they'll be able to put away up to $30,000 uh, at those concessional superannuation rates. Now look, this is a positive. I'm not sure whether the actual quantity of $30,000 will have much of an impact um, in terms of uh, Sydney first home buyers. Um, I've got to understand that the, the uh, uh, average deposit for a property in New South Wales is around about $120,000 and that's what's the killer for first home buyers in the marketplace, saving that deposit. Uh, repayments with these historically low interest rates aren't really an issue for first home buyers. In fact, repayments are around about the same as rent for typical uh, property in Sydney uh, that first home buyers would target. But saving the deposit is, of course, that's even more problematic given that we have the lowest incomes growth uh, in our history. So that really is a constraint to first home buyers. So a $30,000 capacity to save for that deposit, I think that's more of a longer term issue. I don't think it'll impact the Sydney market uh, in terms of significant numbers of first home buyers coming back into the market. However, I think it will make um, perhaps a medium term, shorter to medium term impact on uh, the Brisbane and Melbourne uh, housing markets. It's important to investors to understand that first home buyers do compete with investors for the same product. Also first home buyers, of course, while they're waiting in the queue, uh, provide demand for rental stock. Um, and of course that's um, you know, part of the equation for an investor is to get those returns from renters. So low numbers of first home buyers means higher numbers of renters. So for the Melbourne and um, Brisbane markets, I think it's a positive move, will help them. Uh, in Melbourne from the 1st of July, we have first home buyers are no longer have to pay stamp duty, and that's both for uh, established and, uh, and new homes. Uh, and I believe that that will cause a, uh, and this is what the state government's hoping for, um, you know, a rush of first home buyers into the marketplace. So that'll be, uh, I guess, uh, exacerbated by those, uh, that superannuation policy for first home buyers. So um, certainly that'll create um, or add to the momentum, I believe, in that marketplace from the 1st of July. And of course in Brisbane, which is, um, has quite a stable first home buyer environment. In fact, first home buyer numbers are up in Brisbane over the last year, and that's got a lot to do with the, uh, the, uh, the first home buyer grant uh, boost which is that $20,000 boost for the purchase of new homes. It does finish on the 1st of July. So look, these are positives for first home buyers, particularly in those lower uh, cost or lower value markets such as Melbourne uh, and Brisbane. Um, but I don't think it's going to have a significant effect uh, in the short term. A couple of other interesting policies were announced on the demand side um, were that um, there's now an incentive for those that own, uh, older Australians that own larger homes, um, those that are over 65 that have been in the family residence for more than 10 years uh, uh, and sell, will gain a uh, $300,000 benefit into their superannuation and won't be accounted for in their asset tests. Um, I think this is very significant for a number of reasons. Again, a shorter term, uh, not a short term driver, but more of a, a medium term driver into, uh, into housing market activity. But I think there'll be a, one of the issues that um, um, downsizers face in Sydney and Melbourne particularly is um, um, not just the you know, the capacity to generate uh, income from their capital gains or, 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 or cash from their capital gains from the sale of property. It's finding an alternative property to live in from the bigger property, particularly in an area that they're comfortable with. Uh, and that means typically in the same sort of area where they've been living. And there is a, really a lack of medium density, particularly development for those downsizers. I think this will create some drive into the apartment market. I think downsizers will start looking at uh, larger apartments, particularly inner city apartments as an option um, for um, downsizing from the large family home. 
Uh, of course, it's sort of an in-between track between leaving the family home and uh, moving into a retirement um, village style of accommodation. Uh, and I think this will fuel uh, even more demand for apartments in Melbourne and Sydney particularly. I think the apartment configurations will be largely three bedroom, uh, three bedroom apartments that will uh, account for higher levels of demand from these de those downsides. I think it's an important thing for investors to start to think about is that um, A, I think we'll get more demand for apartments from that particular group, but also that'll mean more uh, development uh, with those configurations, um, and that may mean fewer of the, uh, of the smaller one-bedroom and uh, studio apartment development we've had in Melbourne and Sydney typically over the last, um, over the last couple of years. So a positive there for demand uh, and supply from the, um, uh, the policies that are encouraging um, older Australians to leave the family home. Okay, look, uh, some specific, I guess, investor-focused policies were announced in the budget. Uh, I don't think will have a, a, a big impact on in investor activity. Uh, one was um, offsetting now the claim for travel uh, for investment properties. I think that has been maybe slightly wrought at some, at some level. Uh, I think investors will just, uh, uh, and now that they're no longer uh, able to claim travel to inspect their uh, investment property, I think that those will largely be absorbed. Also, um, some... Uh, adjustments to tax depreciation were also announced uh, in the budget. A again, I think these will only have a marginal impacts on investor activity, um, and they're mainly about really um, improving the bottom line in terms of uh, income for the government. However, I think on, when we look specifically on the supply side, the government announced some incentives for uh, state and local governments to um, release more land to expedite uh, zoning processes. So uh, that's obviously a, policy, uh, a positive because one of the clear issues uh, in terms of housing market balance is undersupply and we still have uh, chronic undersupply clearly in Sydney and I think we still have undersupplied markets um, uh, in Melbourne and also uh, in Brisbane I think we're starting to see those apartment markets uh, soak up pretty quick in those two uh, capital cities. So a positive there encouragement for uh, expediting a, a zoning and new land releases in uh, uh, at local council and the state government level. Uh, something that did um, concern me was that um, the state government is again, or sorry, the federal government in the budget has reacted to what's been concern over the level of foreign investment in development. Uh, two initiatives there. Um, the first was to uh, create some restrictions on the volume or the proportion of international investors in particular developments. Um, I think that's a negative. I think we're still seeing undersupply in Sydney and I think we'll continue to see it in the Melbourne uh, market and the Brisbane market over the medium term. I don't think we need to start you know, creating roadblocks to investment uh, or for, to development. I think that'll only cause, again, those uh, price imbalances over the medium to longer term. Uh, the other uh, policy that was announced was, um, again, some, uh, following on some state government initiatives and that's the empty house tax that we're looking at, uh, they're looking at um, for foreign investors who leave their uh, investment properties empty, that there would be a, um, a particular a fine for that, um, a tax for that. I'm not sure how that's going to be administered or monitored. I think that's going to be extremely problematic. But again, uh, it's part of this disincentive for foreign investment, um, which I think is uh, counterintuitive given that we still have clearly an undersupply uh, of property uh, in Sydney and, and as I said, I think emerging in in Melbourne or continuing in Melbourne and, and um, sooner or rather later I think that'll emerge also uh, in the Brisbane market. So look, um, some initiatives on the supply and the demand side in the budget, I think largely um, responding to what's been a very strong debate this year. Uh, I think however for investors and for the housing market generally, the real kicker in the budget wasn't the policies that were announced, it was the um, revision of the economic forecasts for the national economy. Uh, again, they were uh, downgraded in terms of the level of unemployment, um, growth and um, uh, inflation going forward. It's still very negative in this economy. Uh, I think that we're looking for a, a long period, given those forecasts, which may even prove to be optimistic, uh, a long period of slow growth uh, in our economy, particularly incomes growth. I think this will mean, um, in my opinion, unless we get an improvement in our economic uh, activity, particularly the stats going forward, that we uh, will sooner rather than later, the Reserve Bank will have to act to um, reduce interest rates, official interest rates again. And again, through the budget with the announcement of that bank tax, um, I think that that's another kicker for lower official rates if banks do try to pass on uh, those higher interest rates uh, 
or sorry, the tax through higher interest rates. Um, uh, we're, we're facing perhaps the prospect of another uh, quarter of negative growth. We had back-to-back -back, uh, months of negative retail sales nationally. Um, that's the first time since 2012 we've had consecutive declines in retail sales. Of course, uh, consumption was supposed to be, along with building, the way forward from the end of the mining boom. It looks like that's not going to happen, and um, it shouldn't be a surprise given uh, what we have is emerging record levels of underemployment. We're still losing full-time jobs uh, over the past year, um, and uh, incomes growth is at record low levels. So um, uh, certainly I think that uh, the prospect is for at least a, a neutral outlook on real or uh, uh, interest rates in terms of lower interest rates officially, but higher interest rates uh, for mortgage holders. Uh, and I think that um, um, that is going to generally be the, um, the, the uh, prospect in the future is for a, a very a benign economy and also a, a very benign outlook for interest rates um, going forward. Also latest, uh, beyond the budget, we've seen the latest ABS data on investor activity. Um, we've seen a big surge in investor lending over March. Um, in fact, March was a record month for New South Wales investors. Uh, and I think that despite those higher interest rates and restrictive lending conditions um, that um, have come through those new APRA regulations um, and the banks are uh, trying to curtail investor lending, we're still seeing very, very strong appetite for residential investment really right across the board uh, in all states. And I think this will continue. I think the problem lies with a number of these initiatives uh, designed to uh, curtail investor activity is that um, uh, investors, uh, particularly investors in tight rental markets, and that's most, rent, uh, most rental markets uh, are tight, exception of Perth and, and Darwin, and even those markets are now starting to level off. But I think that um, higher levels of, uh, of imposts, either interest rates or fewer um, investors, will only work their way into higher rents, which investors will pass it on to tenants. So and I think this will have a negative uh, for policy makers going forward and I'm, I'm not sure that they'll continue to pursue these policies. But look, it's still a very fertile envir environment for investors. There's no doubt that investors are still um, very keen to get into the market. I think this is the future in this low growth, uh, low inflation economy will be more interest in residential investment uh, regardless of what our policy makers um, uh, try to interfere with in these market dynamics. And this interference can um, unfortunately uh, tend to cause more problems than the, those that they're uh, that they try to solve. Yeah. All right. Well, hi everyone. Um, if you've got any questions, I hope you can hear me. Uh, if you can't, uh, use your phone to dial in. Uh, but I'm happy to uh, answer any of your questions in what's uh, been a very interesting day today in the housing markets generally with, um, um, I'm not sure we had an official announcement yet, but the New South Wales government is um, going to announce um, some new initiatives for housing affordability. Um, particularly for first home buyers, and of course we've had some data this week that's come out regarding um, uh, what's happening, uh, what's happened over May in generally in our capital city housing market. So, if you've got any questions, just um, uh, ask them. We have a question from Steve. He asks, "How is May data in general for property?" Well, look. Um, we're, we're certainly seeing, I think the big picture is that there's no doubt that we're seeing um, an easing in, in housing market activity generally, particularly in the, um, the Sydney and to a lesser degree the Melbourne markets. Now this shouldn't be a surprise um, given the further we move away from those cuts in interest rates last year, the less energy we have to, uh, to push up prices, particularly at the sort of rates we've had prices increasing in Sydney and Melbourne over the past year. So. Um, However, the underlying drivers still remain quite strong in, uh, in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, but there's no doubt that uh, going forward without, again, some uh, cuts to interest rates that would have be effective, and that is that weren't offset by higher rates from the banks, we're not going to see uh, the type of prices growth we've had uh, in recent years. But look, the, the underlying supply and demand dy dynamics are, are strong in Melbourne and Sydney, particularly net migration, record levels of migrants into Melbourne. Um, and near record levels into Sydney. Sydney's still undersupplied um, with property, uh, even though we've had a remarkable building boom in that city over the last couple of years. There's more stock to come into the market, but there's no doubt that um, you know, demand will remain ahead of supply. It's just that the capacity to push prices up isn't as strong. But similarly, in Melbourne, um, it's had a, a significant building boom over the last uh, couple of years, particularly apartments, of course. Um, but that's 
also not showing any signs of helping to ease uh, an under under supply of uh, an under supply of property in that market for various reasons. And um, we've got changes to uh, stamp duty for first home buyers in, in Victoria from the first of July, and I expect that to unleash a significant um, uh, demand from first home buyers. That's what it's designed to do, uh, and that'll mean um, pushing upwards of prices, given that you know the notional. Um, the notional benefit with no stamp duty paid by first home buyers is around about $10,000, and that can be used as a deposit sort of um, moving forward. So, um, uh, as I said, even though prices growth is easing rather than falling, uh, and those monthly numbers can tend to be volatile, I would expect uh, most markets to continue to record uh, prices growth going forward. So we have another question from Seb. Do you see the banks continuing their stance on raising interest rates per their own discretion? Well, I think that's very interesting. Um, the point is that obviously in the short term, you know, headlines that are telling us that uh, you know the the market's peaked and and perhaps is falling, which is nonsensical, but still will work into confidence. And um, even though the banks have uh, um, you know are following the rule book in the sense that they're raising rates and restricting lending to investors. Um, I think at the end of the day, the last thing the banks would want is a significant decline in mortgage lending, um, because obviously that's how they make their money, and 60% of you know of a bank's of a bank's income comes from the housing market. So um, I think that also, uh, given the uh, you know growing um, revelation that rents are, are skyrocketing in uh, particularly Melbourne and Sydney, and that a shortage of um, rental accommodation coming from a shortage of uh, of, uh, of uh, investors um, is only going to impact um, not just the uh, economy uh, through higher rents and reduced uh, um, levels of income, um, but also create issues to do with, um, I guess, social stability where people are unable to find accommodation. So I think that we'll get a, a, an evening out of um, uh, out of cycle rates from the banks because at the end of the day they've got a uh, they have a balancing act between, um, you know, their risk management policies and, and actually reducing their net uh, their net income from the housing market because of um, reducing demand through higher interest rates. So another question: uh, Where do you see any growth pockets in Sydney and Melbourne, especially for a budget under 500k? Well, under 500k is, you know, mission impossible in Sydney. Um, even the, the bookend markets of um, Wollongong and Newcastle are, are, have moved beyond five hundred thousand dollars, significantly behind uh, beyond five hundred thousand dollars. I think we've only got four suburbs now in Sydney with a median of below five hundred thousand, uh, and that's Whale and Macquarie uh, Macquarie Fields um, out, out to the uh, and those that band of suburbs um, out to the uh, the northwest of Sydney on the fringe and. Um, they're growing quickly as well. It's the, the ever, 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 never, never ending challenge to find affordable accommodation in Sydney, at the bottom end particularly. And we're even seeing, you know, um, entry level apartments now moving well behind, well beyond five hundred thousand uh, dollars in Sydney in in a number of areas, particularly new new apartments. Uh, in Melbourne, a different story. Obviously, the Melbourne uh, median is um, uh, around eight hundred fifty thousand. Sydney's about uh, one. One million one hundred thousand, and um, uh, so there's still affordable pockets, um, I believe, down to the uh, southeast of Melbourne, moving down um, Caram Downs, Frankston. Um, it is becoming quite uh, the prices have rise, risen quite strongly in the southeast, the inner middle ring southeast and suburbs of Melbourne. Again, affordability uh, is pushing people further out with higher prices, but also to the north of Melbourne, I think Craigieburn. Um, but areas such as Broad Meadows and now Faulkner, these areas, Pasco Vale, have become quite expensive. Or well, certainly prices have grown quite strongly there as well. Uh, and that's been the real driving part of the market. But I still think you can find uh, properties, um, five to six hundred thousand dollar properties, in the middle outer northern suburbs of Melbourne, and also in the, um, the middle and outer uh, southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. I think there's plenty of opportunity or capacity there for price growth, um, given particularly um, what is likely to be uh, significantly higher numbers of first home buyers moving into the market from July the 1st. So we have another question from Caroline. Uh, what are your thoughts on industrial properties in Oak Flats, New South Wales? 
Well, look, um, obviously there's growing interest in commercial property. Um, smaller industrial um, developments are, are also becoming um, more popular with investors as an option uh, because we are starting to see, you know, the growth in um, storage facilities, small warehouses, um, and, and warehouses rather than factories are, are, are a growing demand or a growing demand source in the commercial market, and uh, and that's that will tend to increase as we move um, away from uh, bricks and mortar shop fronts, more online uh, online purchases, an online retail environment. Uh, you still need um, logistics and storage, and, and that's growing, and, and particularly those the smaller businesses that are looking. Uh, or businesses that are looking to take advantage of storage, uh, high-tech storage facilities. Um, there's certainly a growing uh, demand uh, for that type of small-scale industrial uh, investment. And I think the, the area uh, 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 across from Parramatta to where the proposed, out to the southwest, to the, where the proposed uh, Badgerys Creek or the Badgerys Creek Airport is going to be built. I think you'll find a number of infill, um, a, a number of infill. Uh, commercial developments will start to be part of that uh, development uh, outside the, the Parramatta CBD. And Parramatta is set to become, you know, the, the next major or, or a major uh, option to the Sydney CBD. And I think you'll you'll find out to the southwest and the west of Parramatta, you'll find a lot more commercial development uh, taking advantage of its proximity to the airport. And I think that small scale industrial uh, investment investment, particularly uh, in terms of storage and warehousing. Uh, is a good option going forward, particularly in Sydney, out to that west southwest area. We have another question from Sam. Hi, Andrew. What is your view on a potential oversupply of housing in Sydney, in particular the northwest corridor, and any and is there a potential for a correction? Well, look, we've certainly been, um, uh, a, a, you know, a hostage to oversupply. Um, the prospect of a potential oversupply in the Sydney market, but um, look, the factors are that you know um, supply never matches demand in the short term because obviously demand is more of a short-term driver than supply. Supply takes the time for developers to respond and planners to respond to changes in demand. Um, and what has been or has been since the GFC an undersupply of property has been a couple of factors. Firstly, uh, um, as was mentioned in the video, the uh, migration is very, very strong in New South Wales at the moment. We had uh, 60,000 net migrants. That's the difference between those coming and going, both interstate and international. 60,000 into New South Wales over the year ending September. Now, that's a near record uh, growth level for, uh, for New South Wales. And of course, most of those are heading into Sydney. Now, the reason for that, of course, is um, Sydney remains the strongest of the major capital city economies. Its unemployment rate uh, is currently at 4.3%, and um, that's 2% uh, lower than both uh, Brisbane or, or Brisbane, Melbourne, and Perth. Um, so it's obviously a, a attracting a job seekers, as well as a very significant lifestyle market. Uh, the Sydney will remain not just an economic market. And so that short term, it, that creates short term demand for property in, in Sydney, and that's helped to soak up. Uh, particularly the apartments coming through, um, and generally not just northwest, but also areas such as Parramatta and uh, south of the city, where there's been a lot of um, uh, new apartments coming in, and, and more to come, of course. But the, we still have a backlog, it seems, of supply. Um, the other factor that's um, soaking up supply, or one of the other factors, is um, um, uh, a number of the uh, international investors are leaving their apartments empty, and uh, of course the government's taken action. To and I believe the state government will follow suit, take an action to try to, um, you know, uh, reduce the number of empty houses. I'm not sure how successful that will be, but that certainly means that a lot of the new supply hasn't added to the supply of housing. Um, and the other factor that's um, that's um, reducing supply, uh, despite the new development in um, uh, in Sydney, is Airbnb. We're seeing Airbnb uh, becoming a significant player in terms of um, taking what was typically uh, longer term rental accommodation and uh, pulling it into the holiday and business, short term holiday and business uh, accommodation market. And um, that further reduces, um, re further reduces supply, uh, even given, um, you know, the, the record levels 
of uh, new apartment development that we've had. And of course, Sydney's problem is that it remains, um, you know, it's geographically constrained in terms of, you know, unlike Melbourne and, and Brisbane, it can't continue to spread outwards because of the, the constraints of the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury River, the National Park and the, um, the Pacific Ocean. It means it can only really funnel down to the uh, southwest. And we're already seeing, you know, areas such as Oran Park, which is a 60k southwest of the city, um, median house prices there are well over $700,000. So uh, I think the prospects of oversupply are certainly not there, uh, particularly in the Sydney market. I think that the other point is that we're, we're seeing, you know, a very sobering uh, rental market in Sydney at the moment. We've got latest uh, around the May uh, vacancy rates for Sydney yesterday and updated them. I've got vacancy rates in Sydney at 2%. That was slightly up on the 1.9%. That's both for houses and units that was recorded over April. Of course, April was, was a holiday month, so we always expect to see a bit of an uptick. But uh, vacancy rates are still quite uh, tight in Sydney. Um, but the other thing is the latest rents in Sydney for May uh, have both units and houses at $550 a week. So units have now caught up with houses. The median asking rent uh, for a unit is the same as a house. So um, it shows that people who have been opting for a unit because they've been priced out of a house have uh, pushed up house rents to the, the rent, or unit rents to the point where they're the same as house rents. And I think this is a, a, a growing, um, you know, a significant affordability um, crisis really for the Sydney market is the Sydney market's running out of rental accommodation. Of course, that is fertile ground for investors. Um, and uh, as I said, I think that we, we still need a lot more supply um, than what we're getting. It was interesting that uh, we had two markets last year. You mentioned the North uh, West. Um, we had two markets last year that were uh, looking a little bit top heavy in terms of rental accommodation. And that was uh, Parramatta and the Northwest, the Hills District. But um, since then, we, we've seen uh, what was available uh, uh, being quite rapidly soaked up. So, um, you know, there, there's certainly an undersupply of, uh, of rental accommodation. That's really your, your, your signpost to the, the overall level of uh, supply and demand in the marketplace. And in terms of, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to see, regardless of what the state government does to relieve or to try to improve a lot of first home buyers through either uh, increasing the grant or um, reducing stamp duty, we're still going to see, um, we're not going to, I believe, see a return to anywhere near the average levels of first home buyers in the Sydney market. And that means people will be renting for longer, um, you know, and uh, I think that's just a reality. And that's another pipeline of demand for rental properties in Sydney is that we currently have the lowest number of first home buyers in the market um, in, in our, our recorded history, you know, back to the ABS series, using ABS stats. So uh, no, no prospect of an oversupply. We still need more property in the Sydney market and uh, we need to have policies that will encourage uh, more development, regardless of where it comes from, um, rather than length. We have another question from Veronica. Uh, what, uh, with the budget announcements, what is your expectation about demand for older properties built pre-1987? Well, I, I guess changes to, and I, that's not my level of expertise in terms of uh, um, uh, tax depreciation. Um, but look, I think the government's, you know, trying to, uh, you know, find a way to tap into um, as much investor energy or income as it can without, you know, creating an imbalance. And um, as I said, that's not, uh, the tax depreciation models aren't my uh, field of expertise. Um, but tax depreciation as well as capital gains, discounts um, and negative gearing remain a significant um, uh, driver of investor activity. And again, as I said in the video, I believe that we're going to see more investor activity uh, generally through this cycle as a proportion, uh, given that it's not just about prices growth uh, as it typically is and still is in terms of in interesting investors, that is capital depreciation. It's also about yield uh, yield advantages that we see currently the yields, um, the yields uh, compared the yields on residential property gross yields compared to underlying yield. That's the yield, uh, say from term deposits uh, in this very low yield economy we've got now, um, are at record levels of um, of uh, disparity. So we've got yields higher than they've ever been relative, or, or house uh, rental yields higher than they've ever been relative to uh, underlying bank bank yields and uh, this is another driver, return on investment, uh, together with those um, 
tax advantages, uh, including depreciation, even though some of those aspects have changed, but also um, uh, you know, the, uh, the capital growth, which will continue, will be at a lower level going forward. We have another question from Steve. He asks, uh, what affects capacity to push prices up, referring to Sydney? Sorry, could you just ask, ask that one again? What affects capacity to push prices up in Sydney? Well, look, uh, there's no doubt, and it's almost simplicity that um, uh, that's simplistic that interest rates are the, are the real deal here. And, um, you know, interest, higher interest rates mean lower prices, lower interest rates mean higher prices. And, of course, the rate of growth does depend on local factors. Now, we've, we've had lower interest rates, of course, over the last five years, um, but that hasn't really worked in the Perth market because Perth was strong early days but has fallen away recently because of... Um, uh, local factors, and that's the end of the mining boom there. But Sydney and Melbourne have clearly had the strongest underlying demand, supply and demand factors, and that mean, means that they've had the strongest um, price outcome. So uh, to elevate prices from, I guess, uh, just above uh, the inflation rate, which we would guess would be sort of a, an underlying uh, equilibrium rate for prices growth, um, you would need lower interest rates. Now, even though I believe we will see uh, I think the, the odds are starting to shorten that we will get a cut in interest rates uh, over the next few months unless the economy improves. Uh, I don't expect that to have a substantial in, impact on, um, on prices, uh, price outcomes. We'd need uh, a number, perhaps two or three cuts in interest rates to offset what are still higher rates from the banks for us to reactivate, uh, reactivate housing markets. But nonetheless, lower rates would mean higher prices and prices growing, um, you know, at above that sort of four to five percent or three to four percent underlying rate uh, in the stronger housing markets such as Melbourne and Sydney. But the other factors that are pushing up um, prices, not just interest rates, although that's the the underlying um, driver of prices, uh, it, uh, are local factors, particularly uh, given changes to the tax mix, um, and and I mean changes to particularly in Melbourne to the first home buyer stamp duty, which I believe, and it's designed to do that, is to release uh, significant numbers of first-home buyers into the marketplace. And I think given uh, where those buyers will, will purchase and um, given the fact that it's for established as well as new property, that um, that will result in um, a ripple effect of higher prices uh, in the Melbourne market. As I, I don't think, you know, there's that, that, certainly a, a solid case to say that there won't be any significant downturn in Melbourne price growth uh, this year, um, but um, you know whether it'll, it'll be another double figure year, I think remains um, remains still uh, an outside possibility. But I still think Melbourne will grow by between um, by around seven percent this year. And on the topic of Melbourne, we have a question from Naz. Uh, she yeah. asks, with prices increasing in Melbourne, do you see yeah. people migrating towards Bendigo, Ballarat, and Geelong? Yeah, well, look, that's interesting. The, there's no doubt the Geelong market's been very strong over the last year. In fact, it continues to grow strongly. Um, and, you know, with a median house price just over 400000 you can understand that. I mean, Geelong's becoming more and more part of um, Greater Melbourne. You know, the gap between the, um, you know, the fringe of Geelong and the fringe of Melbourne is narrowing. Uh, it's really only, a, you know, a 40-minute drive uh, from one to the other. Uh, which is sort of less than you'd get in some of the commutes that happen if you're in the Greater Melbourne area as it's um, as it's uh, set now. So I, I think we will see more demand in Geelong. I think we are starting to see more demand. Uh, migration is quite strong into Geelong as well. Um, that's seen a, a growth in net migration. The uh, local economy is actually performing better than Melbourne. Unemployment rate is lower than the Melbourne unemployment rate. Um, and as I said, prices are growing there. And it's not just uh, you know, affordability uh, issues that are driving Geelong. It's um, also lifestyle, of course. Geelong is the uh, the gateway to the Surf Coast. Um, surf Coast is quite expensive now, of course. It's uh, a, a particularly a, a holiday lifestyle type of market. But, um, yeah, I think that there's plenty of upside to Geelong. There is that obviously happening now. Bendigo and Ballarat are interesting. Um, Bendigo is not quite a commute market, although I know a number of people do commute from Bendigo to Melbourne. Um, but Bendigo and Ballarat, tend to track each other, although they've sort of diverged over the last few years. We, we had a, a strong period of growth in Ballarat and quite a subdued period over the same period in Bendigo. Uh, 
Um, but uh, that's reversed itself recently, and Ballarat market's been quite flat. Uh, but Bendigo's picking up quite strongly, and I think there's uh, a lot of perhaps downsizers and um, that are coming back into that Bendigo market. Um, uh, empty nesters moving into the, the regional areas. Macedon area is quite strong too. Um, but Ballarat's been flat. It's been a bit of a surprise. It's a very affordable market. Median's over three hundred thousand dollars, and um, you know I, I would expect the Ballarat market to grow as prices in the western suburbs of Melbourne increase, as they are now in the northern suburbs. I think that that Ballarat option, uh, given that it's um, you know, a, a, a quite a, um, uh, a a positive commute from Ballarat to Melbourne, uh, given um, the employment opportunities in the western suburbs, um, and given the, the the rural sense of a lifestyle, and look, a very significantly established big city Ballarat is, I think you'll see more demand um, moving into Ballarat. As I said, after what's been a bit of a soft period over the last year, uh, following a strong period, uh, driven by those affordability advantages um, and, and particularly given continued strong growth uh, in the, uh, the budget market in Melbourne in the, in the west and the north, the northern, outer northern and western suburbs. We have a question from Jeremy. He asks, what is the outlook for Adelaide in terms of growth over the next few years? Yep. Well, look, I think Adelaide's been a real quiet achiever. I mean, we've seen prices growing in Adelaide consistently around about Four percent over the last three years, and you've got to remember, Adelaide's you know had a you know had a, had an extremely underperforming economy, and it's not just been a roller coaster ride such as the Darwin and Perth economies, which you know um, had the, uh, the the tremendous drive of the resources boom um, in 2012 and 13, and then came to a, a sudden halt. Um, Adelaide's had a, an underperforming economy for a number of years now, with um, you know near near all the highest unemployment in the country. And yet, its housing markets have continued to uh, to um, you know uh, to tick over. And uh, as I said, overall prices in Adelaide have continued to grow by around about um, uh, three or four percent a year over the last three years. Uh, the, the key areas in Adelaide, of course, are the northern suburbs, of Elizabeth. These areas have been you know um, hit by uh, un unemployment. The end of manufacturing, uh, particularly, um, has impacted those markets. But Adelaide remains clearly the most affordable uh, market capital on the mainland, and uh, it also provides uh, good yields in in what is a um, again an undersupplied rental market. Right? Vacancy rates are quite low in Adelaide for houses, um, and, and I'm always a little um, surprised there's not more investor activity in that Adelaide market, given the um, uh, you know the relatively low entry level, the higher yields, um, and the consistent capital growth that market's um, produced. I think Adelaide. Um, has a fairly um, uh, conservative view about housing market activity. It doesn't tend to have the peaks and troughs that other capital city markets have through the cycles. Um, it just tends to sort of keep on keeping on. And um, as I said, I think it's been a remarkably resilient market given how um, how uh, the negatives of, of the local economy. And of course, the other the negative for Adelaide has been given the underperformance of the economy, uh, it tends to lose a lot of uh, locals to migration, interstate migration. But interestingly enough, it's, it, it picks up a lot of international migrants because of its uh, affordability advantages uh, and I guess the, um, the low density uh, nature of, the, of Adelaide itself. We have a question from Andy. He asks, I have a subdivision block in Marsden, South East Queensland and want to know the market outlook uh, to start with can completing subdivision work and to sell the blocks or should he wait until the next market move? Well I think South East Queensland is another market that's just starting to find its feet. Um, uh, you know the, the look it had the same issues that Adelaide has had in terms of or well, more so it's had you know the end of the mining boom um, which has really and continues to affect central and northern Queensland uh, regional areas. Um, it also had a, a period where um, there was a significant shakeout in particularly public sector employment. There was a lot of job shedding. That had a, a big impact on, um, and this is in Brisbane, on um, the confidence uh, and the economy. Um, but similar to Adelaide, Brisbane has sort of kept on keeping on as well. Of course, it had the floods in 2011, the Brisbane floods. Um, so despite, I guess, a number of negative issues to do with, um, as I said, the floods and the economy, uh, Brisbane uh, house prices have grown. 
by around about four or five percent each year over the last uh, three or four years. And I think again, similar to Adelaide, that market's um, you know uh, continue to be reasonably robust. Now the big thing that's impacted the Queensland and the Brisbane market has been a big shift in migration. Um, we, we saw um, last year or the year before last that net migration into Queensland was at a 30-year low um, and mi migration has been a, a real strong driver of the Queensland economy and the housing markets, particularly southeast Queensland. But we are now starting to see a turnaround in that. Uh, the, num the trend has certainly turned around on the latest ABS data. Um, but migration is now picking up back into southeast Queensland. Um, I, I think that's not surprising uh, given that the Brisbane median is half that of the Sydney median. Um, and, uh, you know, still a, a comparatively reasonable performance up in the economy, particularly compared to um, uh, Melbourne, which has a similar uh, economic profile. But um, I, I expect um, a continued solid performance from Brisbane this year in southeast Queensland. Um, we've had strong growth in first home buyer numbers, which has worked its way into sort of subdivision, um, you know, as, as into building block um, demand, such as what you're talking about there. Um, and uh, that's due to the boost, the first home buyer boost that um, Queensland's had for first um, uh, extra $10,000, which ends on the 1st of July. Um, Maybe they'll consider uh, continuing that first home buyer boost. It's been a positive for, for demand as well as um, uh, construction and the economy. And um, so I think I'm actually quite positive about southeast Queensland, Brisbane uh, generally. And of course, the other point is that the Gold Coast is now a very strong market, it's the strongest market in Queensland. Um, I expect prices to grow by up to 10% uh, on the Gold Coast this year. And with the Commonwealth Games next year, I think that'll just add fuel to um, uh, interest in southeast Queensland, as well as um, you know demand for um, uh, demand for property uh, generally. And I think that'll start to activate what's always been a, a very solid uh, lifestyle destination, particularly um, for Victorians and um, and also for those from New South Wales. But the other point for Queensland is that or for southeast Queensland is that northern New South Wales. Uh, is a very strong market at the moment, strongest regional market in the country, um, and a lot of buyers are pushing over over Tweed into the Gold Coast, uh, looking for affordable options. And uh, I think that's just another significant driving force for the southeast Queensland um, housing market. So I'm, I'm actually quite positive about the prospects of that market. Even the apartment market in Brisbane is now looking like uh, it's starting to rebalance. Agents are reporting listings are starting to dry up. Uh, not everywhere, and there's still stock to come through, um, but the the building approvals have, have almost halted there now. So I think we're seeing a rebalancing even of the Brisbane apartment market, and um, with yields over five percent, I think that really reflects uh, just what a good value that market uh, is at the moment. So we have a question a question from Christina. If you were going to invest around seven hundred k, what's your top pick in terms of capital city, and would it be a house or an apartment? Um, well, look, it's these things, prices ebb and flow, you know, it's it's not really, I think the days of the hotspots are sort of a little bit behind us, but um, on the numbers, the, the best value um, for, uh, in terms of yields, uh, are, are certainly the smaller markets, uh, Hobart is a very strong market at the moment, I'm always a little surprised there's not more interest in the Hobart market, um, uh, yields are, are the highest in the country, and in fact, um, and this is for houses that, that houses are, are growing faster in, in Hobart than just about anywhere else. And it has a, a shortage of, of rental accommodation, just that there seems to be a, a sort of a, a dislocation attitude towards investing in Hobart. But certainly Hobart is a, a very strong market at the moment and, and migra higher migration and an improving economy is part of what's continuing to drive that. Uh, Canberra units are also um, provide quite high yields. Uh, again, a tight rental market. Uh, there's been a lot of stock coming into that Canberra market over the last couple of years and to continue uh, coming through, but there's um, no shortage of demand for um, uh, rental accommodation in Canberra. And those, uh, again, those yields are over 5%, which I, I, I guess do signal uh, over the medium term um, a good value opportunity because those yields would be, you know, a, a notionally too high and, and show that prices are, 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 are lower versus rents um, in a relative sense. and um, also, Brisbane apartments for a medium to longer term view. But look, um, as I said, I think that um, 
good good investment opportunities for houses specifically. Uh, I think that there'll be continued growth in Melbourne's northern suburbs, north uh, western suburbs, middle inner ring suburbs, and in the southeastern suburbs. Uh, looking for properties valued around about that six hundred thousand dollar mark. I think that there's a still reasonable prospect of an upside there uh, in those markets. And, and as I said, there's plenty of demand for rental properties there. So I, I guess within 10 to 15 k's um, of uh, of the Melbourne CBD, I don't think you have to even have to pay 700,000. You could probably get something with good upside value at around about 600,000. But certainly, I think that that part of the Melbourne market is still quite strong and will continue to be uh, reasonably strong through the remainder of the year, given the prospect of uh, more first-time buyers into the marketplace. What is your view on the Perth market, and will we see some improvement? Well, we're starting to see some early signs now that the Perth market is bottoming out. Um, I think that the price cycle will reach its uh, trough this year. Um, it'll still remain, and if it does, it'll remain well ahead of its previous trough, which is within 2011-12. Um, but having said that, the bottoming won't mean a, a significant revival in prices. Perth suffered from a, you know, a, a, a quite a, a sharp downturn in its economy. So employment rate is now well over six percent. You know, it was at four percent just a few years ago, um, and the downturn has been driven by the end of the fly-in, fly-outs. Um, that's reversed. Perth's got a very low number of net migration, uh, net migration compared to where it was during the peak of the mining boom. And of course, that means um, the rental market has suffered particularly given the short-term nature of that fly-in, fly-out market. Um, so, um, and we've seen prices in Perth now are at three to four-year lows, house prices. Um, but we are starting to see that trough. Uh, I believe it'll trough this year, and it's the value uh, perceptions that buyers start to think. You know, that this is, you know, a, a very cheap price, three or four year lows, low interest rates. I, I, I may trade up to the next level. It's a good value for me if I can find a buyer for my property. Um, I think that creates momentum in that sort of value perception when a market does trough out. Um, uh, and I, as I said, I expect that to to at least find its bottom this year. Um, lower interest rates and an improvement with the economy, particularly improving the economy, it would drive the market. But I still think that it's set to you know, grow gradually, all things being equal next year. Now, the other positive signs from the Perth market, and forget positive, is that um, vacancy rates are now falling in Perth. Um, the vacancy rates, we had 3.8% for houses over, um, over May, latest data. Um, and that's the lowest um, we've had for over a year of vacancy rates. And the market, the vacancy rates are now uh, falling gradually, um, and we've also seen a flattening. And rents are now are at six-year lows and amongst the lowest in the country now. Perth rents, uh, but we have started to see stabilisation um, over the last over this year of rents uh, starting to flatten out as well. So some positive signs that the rental market has stopped uh, declining and falling. Vacancy rates are now falling, rents are stabilising, and, and that means that um, you know over time we'll start to see. Um, those significant numbers of, of um, vacant properties start to be soaked up. But a lot depends on the economy. But there's no doubt that you can clearly call the bottom uh, of, uh, likely call the bottom of the rental and the price market in Perth uh, this year. Uh, we have a question from Laurie. He says, uh, what are your thoughts uh, on these new rent bidding apps and how will they insult how, how much of an influence do you think they will have on the rental market and the ability for people to save for a mortgage? So is that the rent what apps? Uh, rent bidding apps. Ah, yes. Well, of course, this is just a sign of the times, isn't it? That with such a shortage of um, of rental accommodation that it, you know we, we're turning it into an auction environment. And I think that state governments will have to act um, to protect you know what are you know typically vulnerable. Um, Segments in terms of income, anyway, uh, of our uh, of our uh, community, and, and it's not just vulnerability in terms of income. It's just trying to find a roof over your head. Um, and uh, you know, there's there's no doubt that um, you know I, I, I don't think it's going to make any difference in terms of supply and demand um, because that'll remain fixed. But it may make a difference in terms of where rents fall. And the last thing I think uh, that the rental market would need is a a sort of a, a rent boom based on a, an auction. Of rental properties, and um, that that would be an absolute nightmare for tenants, um, and something I think the government would have to uh, act uh, act on, um, given you know its um, you know potential for rorting and uh, certainly creating even worse market 
conditions um, than they already are, particularly in the Sydney market. We have a question from Veronica. She asks, she asks, what are your thoughts about the resurgence in investors building granny flats? Do you see that style of co-living as something renters are demanding in the future? Well, yes, I think any anything that adds to in a, an affordable sense to, you know, the stock of housing and that, you know, creates, I guess, a closer um, environment in the family. I think, well, look, we're seeing it's very tough first home buyers, particularly in Sydney. Um, I think we're going to see people living in family environments, uh, even given that rents are so, so difficult to rent a property. And that means we may see changes to the nature of um, the nature of, of, uh, of properties, not just granny flats, but also, you know, creating divided houses, you know, to be able to accommodate over a longer period of time because it's too expensive either to rent or to buy. Um, but there's no doubt that anything adds to an existing property's accommodation uh, in a market that's as tight as the Sydney market, you know, and, and as highly priced, um, you know, can only assist um, some sort of, a, a, you know, improving the balance between supply and demand. We have a question from John. He says, will the land tax increases implemented this year that now make it much more expensive to hold investment properties result in lower prices for houses and units? Well, look, as I said, my only concern with any change to the cost base for an investor in a tight rental market uh, can at least to some degree be offset by increasing rents. Um, you know, and this is the debate about negative gearing or, or any changes to um, you know, trying to, to tap into uh, higher levels of investor activity is that, you know, these things can be passed on. Um, and we're already seeing, you know, the, the nature, we've seen a 30% difference between Sydney rents and Melbourne rents. Um, so it shows you that there's a capacity in Melbourne, you know, in terms of the same types of incomes, and typically they are, pay 30% more in their rent. Now, these things can't totally be offset. Uh, of course, but it, you know, in tight rental markets, and that's most rental markets, they can be passed on to the tenant. Um, you know, who knows that they have to pay, or else, you know, um, get it back into the uh, into the very long queue for the you know for for what's available. Um, but uh, you know, governments have got to think about, I guess, finding you know more in terms of their tax base. This is a problem in our economy if we don't have enough income anymore. Uh, and we don't have the will to increase taxes. Um, and that's what's one of the factors, not just in Australia, but you know, in most advanced economies, is high levels of debt, have, uh, even with zero interest rates, have meant that we, you know, economies haven't been able to kick off as they have in the past. Um, so, you know, it, but it's a question at the end of the day, if you, um, you know, if you target investors, whether, you know, at some stage you're gonna also be targeting uh, targeting tenants, but um, as I said, residential investment, if anything, is in this cycle is is in, and in this economy is becoming more attractive uh, because of how low underlying growth and returns are in in our economy, and even the stock market, which is you know a different, really should never be compared with property, but even the stock market remains 15% lower than what it was before the GFC. Um, so you know it's um uh, it still remains even with the sort of imposts that we're getting, um, and residential investment is still clearly a positive. And we're seeing that with um, you know, so much um, uh, increase in demand. As in, in New South Wales, uh, March was a record month for investor lending, uh, despite those higher interest rates. It's interesting to see if we continue to see that and other higher costs. So we have some time for just a couple of more questions. Yep. Uh, so we have one from Steve. He says he's seen um, in the media a lot of news about a sharp price decline in Sydney. Yep. Do you believe yep. that to be true? No, I don't. Um, the only the prospect for lower prices in Sydney would have to come from higher interest rates. That's clearly the cause and effect. And by higher interest rates, we'd have to see you know one percent you know sort of increase of interest rates. Um, certainly, you know, a number of uh, rises in interest rates. We did see prices fall in Sydney at the end of 2015, uh, and that was because banks raised interest rates both for, for investors from the middle of 2015 and then from owner occupiers um, at the end of the year uh, because of changes to the, the regulators' policies. Now, uh, we did see a sharp decline in prices, but it did follow a very strong period of prices growth, of course. 
And then following that, prices did flatten out last year until we got those interest rate cuts in May uh, and then August. So it's all about interest rates to see a sharp decline. You've got to remember that sharpest fall in interest rates that we've had in, um, in our longer term models was in 1991 during the um, recession that we had then. Um, and uh, we saw Sydney prices fall by around about 9% uh, over a year. Uh, and that's actually the uh, strongest decline or the sharpest decline in prices. But you've got to remember that prior to that period, we had Sydney's house prices over a two year period increased by 80%. So it was, you know, it was a, a correction that we had to have in that sense. And it wasn't in terms of where prices had, had come from. But what I'm saying is that, you know, um, at the very, I think at the margin, a one or two percent decrease over a year in house prices would have to be the outcome of um, you know around about a one percent increase in interest rates and um, supply remains well behind demand in the Sydney market. There's really no sign of easing um, of, of that relationship easing. In other words, supply catching up with demand. If anything, we're becoming more undersupplied, as I mentioned before, with those factors: migration, empty apartments low numbers of first home buyers um, and Airbnb, uh, it, all these factors. And of course, the government's um, creating disincentives for foreign foreign developers. So, um, you know, just, you know, when more property is needed. So, uh, no, I don't, the, the prospect for a sharp decline in, in Sydney's prices is we've never had one before. So, you know, and, and if anything, we've got more of a, a risk uh, averse lending uh, environment anyway. And it's banks and their, 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 the fact that they're not, you know, risk takers in terms of their lending models that keeps the market quite reasonably balanced um, anyway. And, and as I said, even sharp, even periods of um, higher unemployment don't tend to create lower prices. It's more higher interest rates. Um, but uh, there's no doubt the Sydney economy is the strongest in the country and likely to stay that way too. Well, we're going to wrap it up, uh, folks, everywhere there. Um, thank you very much for your attendance today. Of course, we have the show on um, later in the year. and. Um, I think just to finish off, um, we need to be, I guess, more positive than seems most of our commentators are about the nature of our housing markets. Uh, they do ebb and flow, they do come and go. Um, the interest rates are the main game. But I do think going forward into the future, we're going to see a much flatter housing market cycle uh, just about everywhere. Um, and uh, I think that's a good thing anyway for certainty and predictability. Uh, but the other end of that is I think that we're going to see higher levels of investors as a proportion of the market through the cycle in the future. Um, and I think that's just being driven by particularly very tight rental markets and, uh, and higher prices, which um, you know, I, I think um, uh, will ease rather than fall. So all the very best going forward and I uh, hope to catch up with you all soon.